Okay, um, good afternoon everyone and welcome to this exciting webinar where we'll be talking about the Community Sector Blueprints National Framework for Minimum Energy Efficiency Rental Requirements, which is a project under the Healthy Homes for Renters campaign. I'm Kelly Court, I'm the Program Director uh, for Climate and Energy at the Australian Council of Social Service and I'll be chairing this webinar today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'm on Jagger and Turnbull lands and I invite others to please acknowledge the lands in which they're coming from in the, um, in the chat um, or Q&A function. This topic today is of particular relevance to First Nations communities. There are one in three people in Australia that rent, but this figure is significantly higher for First Nations communities. More than 68% of Indigenous Australian adults are renters, with 34% living in social housing and 34% uh, living in private rental. This statistic changes considerably when looking at Indigenous Australians living in remote and very remote areas with 89% renting, including 71% living in social housing. We know that a safe, secure home with working facilities is a key support for the good health and well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It can influence life expectancy, young child mortality, disability, chronic disease, and family and community environment violence. Yet a report from the Kimberley Community Legal Service um, Centre called Stuck in the Heat, Lived Experience of Public Housing Tenants in Kimberley, showed a picture um, that demonstrates that the effects of extreme heat in inadequate housing is impacting not only on the health of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tenants, but their social, mental and financial wellbeing. Um, this topic today, um, is very important. The need for mandatory energy performance standards in rental properties, which will include public and community housing and private rental, will be critical to improving the health and wellbeing of First Nations people. Um, as part of the acknowledgements today, I'd also like to acknowledge the Honourable Shane Rattenbury, MLC, who's the um, Attorney General and Minister for Climate Change and Sustainability from the Australian ACT and he'll be speaking with us today and I'll introduce him a little bit later. So thank you Shane uh, for joining us. And I'd also like to pass on the apologies from Minister Jenny McAllister who also wanted to be here today to speak with you all but unfortunately had a clash at an in-person event in Melbourne. And pass on apologies from Minister Keane, Minister De Bruyne and Minister Johnson. And I'd also like to acknowledge and thank Energy Consumers Australia for their funding of Better Renting, who coordinates the Healthy Homes for Renters campaign, and for their previous funding to ACOS, which enabled us to coordinate the development of this community sector blueprint. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge my fellow, fellow working group members who led the drafting of the community sector blueprint. Um, Joel Dignam, CEO of Better Renting, Bernie Bunnett, Barrett from Better Renting, Jemima Mowbray from Tenants Union New South Wales, Douglas McCloskey from PIAC, Caitlin Perry from NTCOS, and special mentions to Rob Murray Leach, Rob McLeod, and Luke Reed, who also provided valuable input along with over 100 members of the Healthy Homes for Renters campaign. Um, so I'll just quickly run through the agenda for today. So um, I will briefly run through the purpose of the Community Sector Blueprint and the processes we undertook to develop it. We'll then hear from Shane Rattenbury, Minister for Climate Change and Sustainability from the ACT to talk a little bit about what they're doing in the ACT around energy performance standards. Um, we'll then also hear from a wonderful panel um, who will lead us through understanding the community sector blueprint um, better. So Joel Dignam from Better Renting, Rob Murray Leach from Energy Efficiency Council, Leo Patterson from Tenants New South Wales. And also really privileged to hear from um, people with lived experience, people who are living in poor rental properties and to hear from them what 
having mandatory rental standards would mean um, for their lives. And so we will also hear from Gemma, a renter in New South Wales, and, Sa and Shasha, a renter from Western Australia. Then Joel will take us through um, how you can engage with the community sector blueprint. We'll then bring panel members together for a Q&A session, and then I'll do a quick wrap up. So just quickly, I'll just quickly over, overview um, the purpose of the blueprint and how we got to where we got to. So the community sector blueprint was created to inform the development of the national framework for minimum energy efficiency rental standards, which is being produced by federal, state and territory governments as part of the trajectory for low energy buildings. And I just wanted to pause here because one of the reasons why we're having this conversation is because many of you that are on this webinar today, um, a few years ago, engaged with federal, state and territory governments and advocated for existing homes to be included as part of the trajectory for low energy buildings. And, you know, really, we were really excited that um, federal and state territory governments heard how important it was that we bring the 8 million homes along on this journey of reducing emissions and agree to include them as part of the trajectory process. And through that process, we identified what were some of the important levers that were needed to um, improve the energy performance of properties um, to help reduce emissions and um, mandating energy efficiency standard for rental properties was one of those levers that was identified and you know really pleased that federal state and territory governments are working to develop that national framework so I just want to acknowledge the previous groundwork and advocacy that went into where we're at today so the blue Print responds to the unique situation that renters face. Unlike owner occupiers, people who rent cannot make structural changes to their homes. And as a result, millions of renters are living in homes that are too hot in summer and too cold in winter and make them sick. And, um, you know, we've just seen two reports come out in the last two weeks, one by Better Renting, uh, which, which profiled people who'd been tracking the temperature of their homes over summer. Um, and heard about the impacts that hot homes were having on their lives. And also a report from ACOS, um, which surveyed more than 200 people living on low income and the experience they were having over summer with their heat. And you know what we found um, in both those really important pieces of work is that um, certainly the heat was making people sick. Um, some people were spending time outside because the heat in their home was more than the heat outside. Um, and, you know, certainly in our survey, um, people talked about the need to go to doctors and to hospitals because of the adverse experience of heat in their home. Unfortunately, um, the problem is that there is no price signal or incentive or requirement on landlords to raise the standards of their properties. And if governments are to meet emission reduction targets and improve outcomes for renters, um, so to help them improve their health outcomes, reduce energy bills, improving the energy performance of rental properties is critical. So, um, we drew on the expertise of members, organisations from the Healthy Homes for Renters collaboration um, to develop this blueprint, and I mentioned those members before. Um, we, we, we worked on an initial draft of what we thought were the key elements in there, and we took an approach, a principles-based approach to develop the key elements of the framework. Um, we then went out to the members of the Healthy Homes for Renters collaboration to get their feedback um, through a webinar consultation. The working group then looked at that feedback, developed it further, and then went back out again to the members of the Healthy Homes collaboration. Um, so it's been a long process over a good six months. Um, we've had 
really important feedback um, to develop this. And, and now we're at this stage where um, we have released it and today is the official launch of the webinar. So it, what it does, it provides an overview of minimum energy efficiency standards for rentals and goes into details about why we need those standards and goes into details about the scope models and assessments for standards, certification and certification compliance. compliance. It also looks at incentives, what renter protections would need to be put in place and what some of the governance models can be. It also provides suggestions and recommendations from the community sector based on this set of overarching principles. So the way we envisage it is that this blueprint um, is to provide organisations with an advocacy tool um, to go to state and territory governments on what we want to see um, as part of the framework that they're developing. It's also a resource to inform policy decisions for public service and politicians. The blueprint provides a clear outline of current thinking in this policy area and what the community sector organisations are advocating for. So that's a little bit of an overview of the blueprint. Um, and we'll hear, as I said, we'll hear a little bit more about the detail of it when we get when we come to our panel. But before that, um, we'd like to hear um, a little bit more from Shane Rattenbury. Um, in the blue, I just want to say in the blueprint, what we're advocating for is that states and territories support uh, implementing model performance. So that is. Um, by 2025 and have a really clear pathway about how we will increase um, those standards over a long period of time. But what we've also said is that for those states and territories that can begin the process now, um, that they should be doing so. And we're really pleased that the ACT and the Victorian governments have done that and have begun processes to, um, to start improving the energy performance of rental standards. And it's, it's a great pleasure to have Shane Rattenbury here today to talk about what is happening in the ACT um, around minimum standards, as well as banning of no cause evictions in the ACT. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Shane and, and um, thank you very much for joining us here today. Thanks very much, Kelly. Yuma, Dorawa Nuna, Dorawa Nunawal. In traditional language, hello. Uh, I'm coming to you from Nunawal country and I'm really pleased to join in this seminar today. Uh, I really want to commend the Healthy Homes for Renters collaboration for their work on this blueprint. I think it's really important work and it's vital that the voice of renters is central to the framework and this policy paper will help ensure that is the case. We, as Kelly's touched on, we really need systems to improve the rights of renters in this space around energy efficiency standards. Too many people live in houses that are frankly too damn cold in the winter, uh, too damn hot in the summer, they're expensive to run and they're not good for our health and wellbeing. And the introduction of minimum energy performance standards is vital in that context because with changing climate, uh, with cost of living pressures, we do need to increase thermal comfort. We need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and we need to uh, contribute to climate change resilience. The introduction of min minimum requirements for rental properties is an absolute must in that context. And it's, I think it's long overdue. What we see is, and there is a clear market failure, otherwise known as the split incentive, but essentially landlords have no motivation to do this work. And that's where I think there's an essential role for government to step in and regulate, to actually break that market failure and require these standards to be put in place. They will not happen otherwise. And that is why I think a legislative or regulatory response is, what we need. I do hope that uh, you know, a nationally consistent approach will be put in place through the national framework, but certainly in the ACT, we have decided to step ahead sooner. It's actually not as soon as I would have liked. I actually first introduced the bill on minimum energy performance standards as a private member way back in 2010. 
and unfortunately it was not uh, supported in the parliament at the time but it's very nice to some years later become the attorney general and have responsibility for this and actually be able to bring forward this regulation as the minister responsible. So as Kelly touched on, we've got two key reforms coming through this year in the ACT. One is on the minimum energy efficiency standards. The other is on no cause evictions. And I think there's some interesting interconnections between those as well. And I'll, I'll touch briefly on each of them. In terms of the minimum energy efficiency standard, this will actually commence on the 1st of April. So in just a few weeks time, uh, there is a phasing period over the next three and a half years. And from the 1st of April, rental providers will be required to indicate whether their property meets the minimum standard in any rental advertisements and also in the lease agreement. Renters and prospective renters will have the right to request and be provided with information on the property's compliance. The actual standard is to have R5 ceiling insulation uh, in the property. Uh, and if, if it's not there already, uh, the owners will have the next three and a half years to make sure they have it in place. However, if a new lease is signed during that period, they have just nine months uh, past the signing of the new lease to make sure this is in place. We've put these various timings in place to allow both an orderly installation and to build the industry up over time, but also to make sure it's not all done in a rush at the end. We wanna make sure some of this work gets underway fairly soon. Uh, we basically believe this will make a significant difference for tenants. And certainly we've put some measures in place so that tenants will seek a rent reduction or compensation for any period in which the premises does not meet the standard. So we're really making sure we've got the implementation tools here that this is not ignored by landlords uh, or that uh, you know, tenants are not left without the ability to make sure this is put in place. We did engage with stakeholders over the course of preparing for this. And as you can imagine, there were quite a few questions and in some cases, objections put in place. Those included the fear that landlords would simply pass on to the renters the cost of compliance with the new standards, uh, that installation providers would not be able to meet the workload or to get the work done in time, and that the new standards might have an impact on what is already a very tight rental market through the withdrawal of properties and other measures. We have sought to anticipate these issues as much as possible. What we know is that around 60% of rental accommodation in the territory already meets the new standard because it of course has been a building standard for new homes for a while. We think there's around 18,000 properties that will need to be upgraded. Uh, and our advice is that the industry will be able to scale up in that time to meet demand. Particularly now that we've made this law, there is confidence that it will happen. Uh, we, we are working with the industry now to improve training and to get more supplies into the market. We've also provided zero interest loans to landlords through our sustainable household scheme. We thought long and hard about this. We felt that it was not appropriate for government to provide actual cash payments to the landlords, but mindful that some may not have the spare capital to do this, we have made interest-free loans available. Our modelling shows that the likely impact on rental availability and rental price uh, will be negligible. Uh, frankly, the lack of availability of properties is driving price much more than this measure will. And that's another whole problem, but uh, that's our view. And we are working to make sure, you know, some people have obviously been concerned about the history of the pink bat scheme. Uh, and we've got a process in place with the Energy Efficiency Council who are running an accreditation scheme to make sure we get qualified suppliers. Uh, now, Kelly touched on this model performance versus features approach. Uh, and we did not start out with a features approach. Uh, sorry, with the model performance approach, uh, because we did look at it very closely, but we chose the ceiling insulation standard as our starting point. Firstly, because there is no agreed nationally consistent home energy rating tool. And so that created a gap there. Also, this is the least cost and highest impact measure you can put in place. We also looked at things like uh, requiring certain types of heaters, or other measures, but the ceiling insulation, particularly for Canberra's climate, is really considered to be the most impactful thing you can do to improve the energy efficiency of a home. It's also a no regrets measures. It's saying that we can do now, and if we bring further measures later, this will be saying we should be doing anyway. Uh, so from that point of view, you can't go wrong. Uh, and so it also provides us with a strong foundation. 
Well, let me touch very briefly on no cause evictions, because this year we will also be passing legislation to uh, implement a ban on no cause evictions. This comes from a place we've had strong feedback and people on this call will know the reasons why we need to do that, but it comes down to the fact that tenants don't feel they can seek improvements to their property or to raise concerns or to ask for repairs and all those important things uh, for fear of retaliatory eviction. And we think that having banning no cause evictions is a great way to ensure that, that tenants can feel like their house is a home where they are safe, they're secure, they're comfortable, and they don't, can't be evicted by the landlord unless there is a legitimate reason. This is a really important reform in my mind uh, because we do continue to experience difficult rental conditions and that places further pressure on tenants to not seek to enforce their rights. And so whilst there's a lot of good rights in the Residential Tenancies Act, plenty of feedback we get is that people do not feel they can avail themselves of those protections without having a, a risk of being uh, having their tenancy terminated. Uh, this provision has been designed so that tenants can't be evicted without having breached their tenancy agreement or without having been provided with a clear reason. And those reasons are the usual and obvious ones around the sale of the property, the owner wanting to move back in and a few other measures. This has certainly been for me as a Greens Member of Parliament, been a really key policy we've wanted to move forward for many years. And I'm pleased that we now have the support in the Parliament, a majority of members, uh, to bring this into place. So these reforms have not been simple or quick, but I think what we're demonstrating is they can be done. Uh, there are models to implement this, and I really encourage other jurisdictions to adopt them as soon as possible because across Australia, we are seeing this rental crisis. And with that lack of properties and rapidly increasing prices, the scales are really tipped against tenants. And these are really important protections for tenants to tip those scales back some of the way. Thanks very much. And I look forward to the rest of the seminar. Thank you, Shane. And again, really applaud the ACT for moving to for acting early on this and also acknowledge the ACT is the only state and territory that has mandatory and mandatory disclosure as well of energy performance ratings, which is another important lever. Um, you, Shane, before I go to the Q&As, you, you mentioned there one of the reasons why the ACT TT didn't go to model performance is because the infrastructure to enable that, like uh, the measurement tool, um, doesn't exist. Um, mm. How and can you just talk a little bit about how important it is that we have enabling infrastructure um, to support being able to have, um, you know, better better mandatory standards and, and what you're encouraging your colleagues um, to do in this space to ensure that we get there in a timely manner. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. It's actually a really good point. And it's saying you touched on the fact that we've had mandatory disclosure at the point of sale for residential properties for many years in the ACT since early this century. What we are finding is that that standard is becoming outdated and the tools for it are also getting outdated. And I think that underlines the value of having a nationally consistent standard. It means if you move around, you kind of understand it anyway, uh, but also for the small jurisdictions, it is difficult to maintain what can be quite complex models. And so having a national approach where we can all agree to it would be a far better option. Um, I think also, as you talk about that underlying infrastructure, it also means jurisdictions can implement these reforms if the underlying infrastructure is there. Uh, that makes it so much easier. Things like the uh, National Green Star rating systems, you know, they do have an impact and I've seen the impact they have. There's also a side of it where we need to make sure they keep up to date. We did have a situation here where you know, I had a building owner who was very proud and invited me for his, a tour of his new environmentally sustainably, sustainable office building as it was. And he was talking about how it was six star rated, but he put gas in it. And this is in a context where the ACT has 100% renewable electricity uh, and has committed to electrify the city and phase out fossil fuel gas. So we also need to make sure those national standards keep getting updated as these sort of policy developments and particularly energy market developments occur. Yes, that's a really good point that you raised about needing to upgrade those standards and um, 
and recently ACOS facilitated a workshop um, looking at what financial mechanisms can be used to help do scalable retrofits across low income housing. And in that workshop, um, we had a participant there from the Resilient Building Council who actually said that in addition to energy performance, we also should be looking at climate resilience. Um, standards as well and whether there's an opportunity to be bringing them both together so that not only are we um, improving the performance of homes to withstand extreme heat for example which we know will worsen because of climate change but you know can we also include into this standards other resilience measures needed to withstand um, increasing bushfires floods cyclones and and I'm just interested whether um, there had been conversations within the ACT um, around those needs as well. Certainly we're thinking a lot about you, know, you might call that adaptation in that broad sense of it. Uh, I think Australians understand the impact of climate change now. Too many people are experiencing that reality already, whether it was the black summer bushfires or the flooding we've seen in northern New South Wales and Queensland. People now know that climate change is not something for future generations. It's a reality for this generation. Uh, I don't think that conversation is very advanced yet. Uh, in the ACT, our primary focus has actually been on putting in place the what we call the green and the blue infrastructure. So uh, putting tree canopy targets in place to provide that cooling for the city overall, and also thinking about how we can use water bodies to cool the city down. So thinking about it more at that urban infrastructure scale rather than the individual residence scale, but I think it's another area for work as well. Thank you. There's a couple of questions that have come through. Um, in, in the Q&A, uh, one person has just asked, is there a risk of tenants who have little financial resources to afford to apply for a rental home that meets or will meet the standard? Um, um, when there, and there might be a category of tenant who will be forced into homes that haven't met the standards. So I, I think what the question is asking, and apologies if I don't get this right, is, is there a risk that we'll have some properties that have met the standard and potentially increase their, you know, their rent um, and then other people who can't afford higher rents will be left in homes that haven't yet met the standard? Um, mm. I think it's a transitional risk in the sense that you could see that in the short term, but because this will apply to all rental properties, uh, then over the course of the three years, uh, that, that will not become an option. There are a couple of minor exemptions in the legislation where a house is due to be demolished within 12 months. So you might see some sort of low cost uh, you know, rentals there where people are taking them up with a short term tenancy. Uh, but overall, every property, including the, the government properties. So as, as ACT government, we've got about 8,000 properties we need to do as part of this transition. So certainly many of the lowest income and most vulnerable residents of our community will be covered by this as well. Thanks, Shane. And, and that actually answered some other questions that were popping in. So a few people have asked whether mandatory energy efficiency standards would apply to social housing, so public and community housing. And I, I just want to say from the from the blueprints perspective and also um, from what's being developed by states and territories, absolutely it would apply mm. to public community housing and, and private rental properties. And certainly the Community Housing Industry Association have been a key partner in developing this blueprint and a strong supporter of the need to improve the energy performance of community housing properties. Um, so, so it's great to hear that that, that this applies to uh, the the insulation applies. Sorry, I've got a truck going past me. Everybody, the challenges of working from home <laughs> um, uh, applies to public housing. I'm assuming that's also to community housing as well in the ACT. Yeah, absolutely. In many ways, the the tenants who are living in both government housing and community housing will be the ones who will benefit most from this. Uh, they'll benefit the most from the savings and also from the improved health outcomes that we'll get from living in homes that you know, don't have the mold, don't have the cold, 
all of those sort of things. Yeah, thanks. I, I must say one of the benefits of the mandatory disclosures that the ACT has is you have some relatively good data on what mm. is the energy performance of, of homes in the ACT, which we don't have in other states and territories. And, you know, I've been often surprised to see um, the number of homes that have zero energy performance rating um, in a place like the ACT, which, you know, can get extremely cold in the middle mm. of winter. Mm. Um, just one more question um, before we need to move on. Someone's just asked with no cause evictions, if asking for repairs and maintenance, the issue of repeated raising of rents costs seems to be why the tenants are forced out instead of direct ev eviction for asking for too much. Um, many of the protections against this are ineffective in the real world. So how will this be addressed? It's a good question. In the ACT, we actually have a rent cap in place where the rent cannot be raised more than uh, C CPI plus 10% of CPI. So CPI is 3%, the maximum will be 3.3%, for example. Uh, what we have observed in the market is that because of that, tenants get evicted at the end of their 12-month fixed period. The property then goes back on the market with a big jump in the rent. And that's all the tenant... Well, the thing is put to the tenant, either you take this rent increase or I will evict you, and the property comes back on the market, and that's the way of overcoming the rent cap. With the removal of no-cause evictions, we believe we can eliminate a lot of that behaviour, uh, and so that will provide a significant protection in that regard. Thanks, Shane. And I said that was the last question, but someone has asked a really good question, and I know we haven't touched on it yet, and and we do touch on it in the blueprint. But for the ACT with the insulation, what what are the enforcement mechanisms um, that you've got in place to ensure that some properties don't slip through? Yeah, sure. Look, as I touched on earlier, tenants will be able to seek a rent reduction or compensation for any period in which the premises does not meet the standard. That, of course, does require the tenant to seek that out. I know this is a broader debate around uh, should we be putting in place some sort of rental ombudsman. We have not resolved that policy question yet, but certainly at the moment there is, well, in the legislation, there is a, an ability for the tenant to seek that compensation process. So uh, combine them with things like no cause evictions. We, we believe that, again, that will give the tenants a stronger hand. Perhaps not everyone will pursue that path. I, I want to acknowledge that, but it sits there in the legislation as an enforceable point. Okay, thanks Shane. And thank you so much for joining us today and for the leadership in the ACT. Um, um, it's been a pleasure having you, thank you. Thanks very much, Kelly. Okay, um, so now we'll move on to our panel session where we'll hear from Joel, Rob and Leo to talk a little bit more about um, about the blueprint itself, why it's important. And then we'll also hear from Gemma and Shasha um, to hear about how um, the blueprint will be beneficial um, in their lives if implemented. So um, first up, we'll have Joel Dignan, who's the CEO of Better Renting. Um, and Joel will talk about a bit more about the background of Healthy Homes for Renters, the purpose um, and the purpose for the community sector blueprint and why it's important from a cost of living and health perspective. Over to you, thanks, Joel. Thank you, Kelly. Um, thank you, everyone. Hello, my name's Joel Dignam. As Kelly said, I'm the CEO of Better Renting. We're a community of renters working together for stable, affordable and healthy homes. Uh, we've done a lot of work. We have a lot of interest in the issue of minimum rental standards. And today I'll be talking a bit about the, the five years leading up to today and the community sector blueprint, the origin of healthy homes for renters, the origin of the community sector blueprint in that context, and then linking it to some of the contemporary cost of issues that we're seeing and that renters are facing. Over to the next slide, please, Bernie. Thank you. Um, let me see if I can get a slide a bit bigger for myself. Very small. There we go. Great. So, better renting began about five years ago, April 2018. One of the key issues we wanted to be engaging with was energy efficiency standards in rental homes. And at that time, um, quite possibly due to the work of Kelly and ACOS and others, 
there were already a range of organisations working in this space interested in residential energy efficiency. And that sort of was around three, three streams of thinking. One is the energy efficiency specifications for new buildings, one to do with existing owner-occupied dwellings, and then to do with existing rental properties. And the sorts of organisations working have been uh, social sector organisations broadly, uh, who are often working with people in these homes, see the, the challenges that arise when you can't afford your energy and the impact that can have, as well as organisations more in the climate and energy space who also care about that, but are also concerned about um, the avoidable emissions from this sort of energy usage and the potential to cut emissions, but also improve the quality of life that people enjoy in their homes. Fortunately, there's also been great work happening um, at a jurisdictional and Commonwealth level. And the COAG, what was then the COAG Energy Minister's Energy Council, came up with the trajectory for low energy buildings in early 2019. Uh, then, as Kelly spoke about earlier, uh, there's a lot of agitation to see a bit more attention given to the issue of existing buildings, which is where most of us live these days. Uh, and so in late 2019, we had this addendum to the trajectory. And that was a really promising addendum. It laid out various different work streams that would engage with the challenges for existing buildings, one of which was minimum rental standards, and also laid out a timeline uh, for that work to be happening. Um, that was before COVID. <laughs> the timeline changed a little bit over time. Uh, things were simpler then, uh, but it, it has been really good seeing that sort of big picture thinking, long-term thinking about what we can do in this space. Partly uh, alongside that, we then had the launch of Healthy Homes for Renters in late 2020, uh, which leading up to that, we were already working with a lot of organisations, a lot of people interested in these issues, but saw the, the value of having a sort of central coordinating organisation to help bring these folks together, marshal these resources for an issue that so many groups cared about. Uh, and Better Renting has helped to play that role, setting up the Healthy Homes for Renters collaboration, keep it going since then. And the collaboration's going great. It's now got over 120 organisational supporters all over Australia, all really excited about this goal of getting minimum energy efficiency standards in every state and territory by 2025. Fast forward then to early last year, uh, and we had a strategy catch up for the collaboration. And one of the things we really wanted to come up with was a bit more detail around what is the actual ask here? What do we want governments to be doing? This was um, partly also a, uh, a, a response to the consultation that had been happening, being led by Victoria around a national framework for minimum rental requirements. This was part of that uh, trajectory process. What we were finding is the consultation around that framework was quite deconstructed into pieces around compliance, enforcement, policy design. But our experience working with people on the ground is that all these issues are interlinked and we can't really speak about one without touching on the others. So we wanted to create our own version of that framework uh, uh, and that articulate it all in one place and wove it all together. And this is how the thinking began. We probably didn't realise uh, how much effort it would take, but it, it is really exciting now to be launching this and to have seen the fruits of all that labour. It was a very rigorous process. Uh, there was a core group of us working, as Kelly mentioned, uh, consulting extensively with the 100 plus organisations in Healthy Homes for Renters, reaching out to others more broadly. And that has helped to give us the blueprint we see today. What I, I, I guess I really want to note, I think is really exciting about this blueprint, it isn't just a, a letter of demand of a bunch of community organisations banging our fists on the table and saying, we well, have to do this. It's partly that, but um, I think it's also a really useful resource that actually says, this is hard, this is complex, we've also grappled with complexity, here's some of what we've come up with, here's what a solution could look like, here's the sorts of principles we think are important to keep in mind. We're all united here, trying to make sure that people who rent can have healthy homes, uh, and here's, here's one pathway to doing that, and we think it's a pretty good pathway. So I think it is, it is an ask, but it's also an offering, uh, and indeed a blueprint for what action on this issue can look like. So that's a bit of the background and some of the, the thinking that's led to this. I want to speak now about why this issue is so crucial now uh, in, in context of what people who rent are experiencing. And I'm opening with this quotation. This is from one of our renter researchers who participated last winter, talking about the intersection for them of their, their energy costs in their, in their inefficient home and the way that it plays out in their life in terms of struggling to um, afford groceries to feed their family. Uh, and this person really spoke about that being a really tangible issue for them and also the, the anxiety that they feel just trying to deal with those cost of living impacts in an inefficient rental home. Um, I think it speaks for itself, really. 
Uh, if you, we can hop to the next slide. What we are seeing, of course, is that even since that winter, things have got even tougher for people renting. So rents have gone up on average about 10%. We heard earlier this year, energy costs are rocketing up. And at the same time, people are having to be spending more on groceries and on fuel. And if you've got a buffer, that's great. And that buffer might be a financial buffer or it might be an efficient home that buffers your energy costs because it actually doesn't actually cost you that much to stay cool or to respond when the weather gets hotter. But for a lot of people renting in these substandard homes, there isn't a buffer. There's certainly not that financial buffer. There's not that architectural buffer. People are really exposed to these energy costs. Uh, and what does that mean for people? So we certainly hear from people who maybe can afford their rent and their energy costs, but then they have to cut back in other areas of their life, uh, whether it's cutting back on food, like we heard about um, cancelling health insurance, having to cut back on medication. Obviously, you can have lots of really direct effects there. Other people just get into energy debt. They just accept that in order to stay healthy in their home, they're going to have to use a certain amount of energy. They can't afford it. Energy debt is the inevitable result of that. These people do not know how they're ever going to, to pay this debt. And I think a really related issue to this cost of living impact is the stress and anxiety that results from that. When you are living in too hot a home, there's a constant source of psychological stress. When you are worried about your energy bill, when you are dreading it, the day it arrives in the mail, that is a constant source of anxiety and strain on people. So it's a pretty tough situation for the renters we've been hearing from. In that context, this blueprint, I think, is particularly important. It's particularly exciting to think about how much positive difference we can make in people's lives uh, and helping to keep the wool from the door, helping to feel of one less thing to worry about, a bit more confidence that they can afford the energy, they can keep their home healthy, uh, one less thing to worry about in, you know, unfortunately, these challenging times. That's me on cost of living, and I think I'll hand it now to Rod to speak more about this issue. Thanks, Joel. Thank Sorry, I was I was just going to briefly introduce you, Rob. <laughs> so, uh, so, yes, Rob Rob Murray Leach is the head of energy trans transformation at the Energy Efficiency Council. And, you know, the Energy Efficiency Council is a bit of a misnomer because you do more than just energy efficiency as well. Um, and, and, you know, energy performance is, is probably a better description. But as Luke said, if an EEC changed its name every time um, governments changed how they want to describe energy efficiency, you'd be changing your name regularly. Um, so thanks for joining us today, Rob. And Rob's going to be talking about um, uh, the importance of uh, rental standards for energy efficiency and over to you now. Thanks, Kelly. Um, great. If we can move on to the next slide. Um, I'm going to start with some really boring stats and data. So my apologies. I've been given the job of graph boy for today. Um, I would love to do much prettier things that sort of really touch your heart, but I'm the graph person today. So this is uh, my, this is the energy use in my home when I got it. That's the red line uh, over the year. And it's a very inefficient home when I first got it. And the yellow line is the output of a solar system. So why am I showing you this? Some people kind of have this idea that we can just add more solar onto everything and, and batteries and we will solve the problem of energy affordability. And it's just not true. Uh, as we move more and more towards renewables, what really matters is that we match up when we use energy to when solar is generating. So putting our hot water in the middle of the day. And one of the biggest problems, particularly in the southern states, uh, and I'm calling in from, uh, and I should have acknowledged in the land of the Wurundjeri people, um, which is a place that gets very cold in winter, that is very much the opposite of the output of solar. So how do we solve this? One is you can spend a lot of money on storage. Uh, another one is you spend a lot of money on massively oversizing your solar system. Uh, but the third option, which I'm just going to pop up on screen now, is I dropped about $4,000. I had to do some electrical upgrades, wiring upgrades, um, but my home is a very good example of a lot of rental homes in the country. And I've, I say that of having rented until I moved into this little unit. Um, it's a freestanding, very cold um, home. A bit of draft proofing and uh, putting in a decent, efficient heating system, um, drop the energy use to that. And what you can see is it means I'm using a lot less energy at the times when the sun isn't shining, which means I'm using a lot less coal-fired and gas-fired electricity. Now, as we go forward, what that means is I'm also going to be using less energy at the times it's really expensive. We're already starting to see in the energy markets that 
if you use energy when solar is on the grid, whether you have solar or you don't have solar, the price of energy is now really, really cheap at those times, which is what we want. It's a very cheap form of generation. Outside those times, it's very expensive and it's very emissions intensive. So if we want to bring down people's bills and their emissions, um, making their homes more thermally comfortable is a really good thing. Um, but what I'd really like to, to jump ahead, if we can move to the next slide, uh, there's always a bit of a cost and benefit. And there was a really good question about minimum energy efficiency standards and why we use that term, and we can probably come to that in the questions later. This is a, a rating system for homes. Um, uh, it, let's not get into the complexity. What it shows is a very poor home on the far left uh, uses a huge amount of energy per square, square meter per year, and a 10-star home uses very little. What you can see is each star improvement cuts the energy use by about 30% which is great, very simple. But what it means is that say, um, let's say you've got a six star home, that's the current minimum standard, we're going up to seven star, that's still a 30% reduction and that's important. But the, the scale of the benefits you get from moving say a one star home to three stars in absolute terms, in terms of emissions, but much more importantly, builds for households uh, is really gigantic. So focusing on improving the worst performing homes up to what is a minimum standard for health and livability delivers a lot more benefit and bang for buck um like you can you can take a one star to three star home about four thousand dollars which is a lot of money on one hand but you consider that this is like a asset that's going to last 70 years um that's a very big impact so helping people with the lowest performing homes is really important um, there are a few things that are examples of terrible performing homes. Like you can get a lot of complexity and we'll talk about this later in terms of the rating schemes. But my experience, there's pretty much three things that if every home doesn't have them um, uh, or they have those features, are very cheap to fix. One, if the home is really, really drafty, genuinely quite easy and straightforward to fix that. Uh, two, if the home doesn't have any ceiling insulation, guarantee you that that home is going to be miserable and very expensive or if it's got poor patchy ceiling insulation same thing and three uh, if it uses a very inefficient heater so something like a panel heater you fix those three things and you've pretty much taken most homes that might be at say one to three stars and you've you've really chucked them up into the level of comfort and i say that from my experience of my own home which went from uh, i managed to halve the energy bill at the same time as taking the internal temperature in winter from about 10 degrees centigrade to 18 so massive difference much more comfortable home much 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 lower bills and that is something that all of those poor quality rental homes should be brought up to to deal with if they've got those terrible features if we can move to the next slide um, this is a research program from victoria i won't go into the details too much they upgraded a thousand homes what they found is that saved about 972 dollars in in energy costs over the year and more importantly, I think, um, 43 minutes less per less day exposed to really extremely cold temperatures. Great. So we've improved the bills, we've cut the emissions, we've made people more comfortable. The bit I really want to focus on is that lowest line. And this is consistent from research around the world, which is if you take a six star home to seven stars, it doesn't really have much of an impact on health. If you take a one star home to four stars or to five stars, which is very doable, massive impact on people's health and and well-being and what they found from victoria is that for every one dollar you save in energy ten dollars were saved in health costs and that's in things like um prescription costs trips to the doctor so let alone people's quality of life so and it's a really impressive piece of research so i guess my point really is that helping bring rental homes up to scratch what we know from the data this is not Joel's going to talk the really important thing of what are people's personal experiences. I know that people will share those later, but the data supports that really strongly, which is taking those worst performing homes, upgrading them to a decent standard of living, massive impact on bills, but more importantly, a much, much bigger impact on health, which is why I love that this group is called Healthy Homes for Renters, because uh, even on the Energy Efficiency Council, I wish we wouldn't call these energy efficiency standards. They are decent home standards and that has energy benefits and that has very big health benefits. Um, that's it for me for now. Thank you.
think we might be moving to the next speaker if we're still waiting. Thank you. No, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Rob. I was just chatting to Bernie um, and hadn't realised we were finishing so quickly. Thanks, Rob. And uh, yes, as someone put in the chat, uh, love chart boy. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a really good way of visualising things. So thank you very much, Rob, for your time and looking forward to um, having more conversation with you on the panel. Um, so now I'd like to introduce uh, Leo Patterson Ross, who's the CEO of Tenants Unions New South Wales, um, who's going to talk about how the community service blueprint can support renters' rights. Thanks, Leo. Thanks, Kelly. Hi, everybody. Um, the, I'd just like to acknowledge first that I'm calling in from uh, the lands of the Terra Marigal and the north of what is now called Sydney, and these lands have never been ceded. Uh, and acknowledge the owners uh, who, whose lands were taken from them. Uh, so I'm here to talk about how this reform will relate to renters' rights. And uh, I'm gonna run through a few things, uh, some of which is quite fundamental thinking, and then I'll move into some more practical how the blueprint supports it. So ultimately, uh, like R Rob was just getting at, this exercise has really been important to draw out a big part of what constitutes a, a modern understanding of a good habitable home. Uh, and that is something that's far too often just out of reach of many renters in New South Wales and in Australia generally. What's been so important, I think, to the community sector blueprint process and what had been missing from so much of previous reform efforts uh, by government and, and by others has been recognising the dynamics of the rental uh, sector and uh, looking at how to design systems that reflect that reality. So one of the great advantages of this collaboration has been bringing together, you know, really expert uh, expertise from energy, from environmental policy, from government regulatory policy, as well as uh, the actual experience of renters in their home across the country. One of the, the basic issues in the, the dynamic that's been uh, a, a misunderstanding is that it assumes that regulating the contract, the residential tenancy agreement, between landlord and tenant is sufficient to deliver the outcomes. And this really hasn't been happening because that misunderstands the relationship between the, the two parties. One party, uh, the renter, is trying to find a home. They're trying to find shelter from uh, you know, the environment around them, from the, the life's tribulations, somewhere to come and rest and rejuvenate. The other has predominantly been cast as an investor first, and that has been their, their primary um, process in engaging in the interaction. And that means that the interests aren't well aligned. And uh, a lot of the tenancy acts across the country refer to balancing the interests of uh, tenants and landlords. But these things are um, often not just uh, in opposition, but that they can be incompatible if you take them to their extreme. And particularly uh, that's been true in considering that uh, the two parties, in theory, are uh, equal, coming together to negotiate some particular terms, uh, things like the lease length, the rent, and, and so on, um, and that the condition of the property will be an important part of that negotiation. But increasingly, what we have seen is that that is just not a mechanism or a dynamic that exists for the renters uh, in, in approaching uh, finding a home. We've really built in uh, a few features into the, the housing sector that make that a nearly impossible relationship. So uh, there's two big ones that sit in the background here. The first is the existence of no grounds evictions uh, that Shane Reddenbury was, was talking about before. So they have a few names, no grounds, no cause, uh, no reason uh, evictions. And uh, this has been something that's uh, been a, a long time uh, missing in our renting space, and it's great that we are starting to see real traction, uh, not only in the ACT, um, in other states who have not gone uh, to, to the full reform, and we've seen some short, some, some real problems uh, by failing to, to go properly in Victoria and Queensland and 20 years ago in Tasmania. So uh, we need to see the reform had taken seriously. But that, that uh, no grounds eviction undermines everything else that people try and do around renting uh, reform, uh, around designing a system that, that works. The other part is uh, really at this point an endemic built-in under-availability of uh, 
actually affordable, good quality homes that is available for people to move into. And that uh, has meant that even if you aren't being served a no grounds notice, if you're scared or worried about how easy it will be to find a new home, if the quality of your current home is not sufficient, if it's in fact causing you uh, health uh, problems, then that traps you in. Even if you're not being evicted, um, you are not able to find a better alternative. So one of the ways, for instance, this, this comes out is in the kind of famous split incentive, um, which is most often brought up in relation to uh, energy efficiency and particularly in solar installation. Uh, that split incentive is that the, essentially the person paying for a feature doesn't receive a direct benefit and doesn't necessarily receive an indirect benefit in, in the form of say higher rents. Uh, this exists th because consumers aren't able to uh, sort of discriminate against properties that don't have a particular feature. And so there's no uh, kind of demand raising the price of a place that does have a particular feature. So we talk about this a lot in energy standards in solar. What people don't recognize often is that that same split incentive exists right across every feature of a home. Uh, it, it uh, at extreme levels, exists for the roof, for the wall, for the floor, for the front door. Um, most often it comes up in relation to repairs. At the end of the day, in the long term, there might well be a financial cost for a uh, landlord who doesn't carry out repairs. But in the short to medium term, it's often very easy to carry uh, un unaddressing uh, maintenance and repairs uh, and saving that money, and you will still get the same rental return because people are desperate for a home and they will pay for a home even if it's got these deficiencies. So that is why we have to have a uh, repairs, but also a, a generally a standards that addresses the, the standard of the home in recognition that the market will not just deliver these things. Um, it is very difficult to build so many homes that you can create the kind of market dynamic that would produce those results. Uh, you, you probably would say it's impossible. Um, and so we have to have regulation to fill in where uh, what is naturally occurring isn't delivering the particular outcome. So really one of the big shifts we have to see is uh, that the provision of housing, the provision of, of particularly a rented home uh, of shelter is an essential service. And like other essential service providers, people enabling that service uh, need to be a part of the conversation that recognizes that the outcome of a good quality, healthy home is the primary driver of why that industry exists. Any investment, whether it's from government or from the private sector, is about enabling that outcome and has to always be weighted against, is it delivering that outcome? So in the blueprint, we have uh, the, one of the main principles uh, in the renter protection area is this recognition that compliance mechanisms cannot be reliant upon the renter themselves. And this is what has been missing in so much of uh, tenancy reform in the past is because it's built into the tenancy contract, it's reliant on the tenant, on the renter, to bring up a problem uh, and essentially put themselves at risk of not being continued in their tenancy, uh, receiving bad references uh, in future applications, uh, or generally being treated as a, as a troublemaker or, or someone who is uh, annoying, um, it, when all they're trying to do is enforce the legal rights that were written into a contract. So uh, having those compliance mechanisms not be reliant on renters mostly looks like a kind of standards uh, system that uh, also exists in many other industries. So uh, you, if you think about something that's very market driven like food, we have safety standards to make sure that people aren't being poisoned, that the hygiene standards are being met. Um, so this is something that is widespread across essential services generally. We need to see it in renting as well. And of course, our other principles really focused on things like the rent, the, the, the possible implications of the rent, uh, and the uh, re absolute requirement that we remove no grounds evictions so that these terms can actually be implemented. Uh, so that, that has to be in place. Um, and like much of, of, of public policy, we can almost never take things in isolation. We have to understand uh, things like energy efficiency, 
implementation as part of a broader system of uh, housing strategy and in particular the renter uh, sort of regulatory structures. Um, so we're really keen uh, and, and, and um, big supporters of this community sector blueprint. I think I'll leave it there and um, we'll see about questions later. Thanks, Leo. And, and here, here, you were getting lots of applauses and props um, in the chat for, for what you said. And, you know, it's been so wonderful to work with tenants unions in developing this blueprint and making sure that, you know, we have in there safeguards um, for renters. So thank you for that. Um, next on the agenda, uh, uh, sorry, um, now, uh, you know, one of the things I've really loved um, about working this collaboration is, you know, hearing from people directly affected. And, you know, it's great to have Rob actually use his own personal <laughs> example of uh, in, in the conversation. But it's great that we're going to have um, Gemma and Sasha here today to talk about their experiences and how mandatory rental standards um, would be important to, to them. So um, we'll start with Gemma and then we'll move to Sasha. Thank you. Hey, there we go. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for having me. Uh, my name is Gemma McKinnon. I'm a Barkindji woman from Mulcanya in Far West, New South Wales. Um, I have a background in tenancy law and social housing research, uh, but I'm currently working in the field of corporate social responsibility uh, at a global law firm. I'm a renter in Sydney's inner west, and I live in a small house with my husband, our five children, my husband's guide dog, a cat, and a rabbit. Uh, like every family, we have a unique combination of needs and circumstances. Um, hybrid working, children and parents with disabilities, service animals, pets, uh, children enrolled in local schools, co-parenting arrangements, um, and of course, financial circumstances. Um, and all of these things combine to make our needs uh, complex. And when you find a home that satisfies most of these needs, you then build your life around it and, and securing it becomes your um, paramount concern. Um, my house is far from perfect. Um, and when it comes to energy efficiency, I am uh, no expert. Uh, I've actually found the presentation really, really interesting and very useful. I wonder um, what my graph would look like. But um, there are a few things in my home that I see as problematic um, and they all are sort of small issues that combine to generally create larger problems. Um, for example, we have no screen doors um, on our back or front door. Um, and awning windows, and to be honest, I didn't know that they were called awning windows until I looked it up this morning, but they're the windows that open a little from the bottom with a hinge on the top like this. <laughs> um, and so we have no air that flows through the windows, we can't have the doors open. And that means that um, in the warmer months in particular, we're constantly running air conditioners. Um, and it's not uncommon for us to, and I'm so embarrassed to say this, but it's not uncommon for us to run air conditioners 24 seven um, during those really sort of hot weeks during the summer. Um, we have some bedrooms that have no fan or air conditioner. So my toddler sleeps in one of these rooms um, and the baby monitor tells me that his room, uh, you know, some nights during the summer sits at around 29, 30 degrees um, at about nine or 10 o'clock at night. And it flashes red telling me that it's not particularly good for him to be sleeping in such a hot climate, I assume. Um, we have one room that's only really in use for half of the year because basically it's uninhabitable during the summer. Um, and the child that sleeps in that room uses the couch uh, in the living room to sleep during the warmer months. Uh, the house is also very damp, like super damp, moldy, uh, it's, which I think is sort of common in, in the inner west of Sydney um, and generally falling apart. And particularly in the winter, everything is cold and wet. 
uh, my son came in one day to tell me that the walls were melting, uh, but it was just the condensation <laughs> dripping down the walls. Um, Demolding the walls is a constant process for us. So it's much like painting the Harbour Bridge. Um, and it also triggers my child's eczema. Um, so moisturizing him is a similar constant process. Um, also, when it rains a lot, our power cuts out. Uh, <laughs> which, yeah, what are you going to do? Uh, so I'm sure a lot of you are wondering why I continue to live in this house. Um, and there are a few reasons. One is that it's affordable. Um, I won't dwell on that any further because I really don't want to jinx it. Um, and thankfully it does have solar panels, which makes um, the constant air conditioning uh, possible. We definitely wouldn't be able to live in our neighborhood if we had to move. Um, and we do have three children in local schools, which um, makes that, uh, you know, you, you feel sort of connected very closely to the community and, and moving, um, moving schools has a lot of sort of uh, stressful elements on children that you don't really want to impart. Um, also moving at the moment, um, particularly in Sydney, is terrifying uh, because of our complex needs and not to mention the cost constraints, I fear that we might not even be able to find um, somewhere suitable to live and I refuse to move back in with my parents. Um, so, and then, you know, uh, what Leo was just saying really resonated with me. Um, I think the question often comes up as to why we don't ask um, for repairs and maintenance from the landlord. Um, but I don't raise these issues with my landlord, particularly at the moment, um, because like everybody in Sydney, I'm focused on avoiding a rent increase. Um, and that means keeping your head down and keeping your mouth shut. I haven't uh, I had a working oven for about six months. Uh, we've just become very skilled at using an air fryer, um, but it's just not something that I'm willing to sort of push because I, I, you know, am avoiding the rent increase, but obviously I also can't risk termination. Um, and I, though I know my rights and have the skills to uphold them, um, I just generally feel that it's best not to rock the boat given how much is at stake. Um, tenants are not in a position of power, especially in Sydney at the moment, um, amongst my family and friends alone, so actual people that I know. I've seen examples during the last couple of months of landlords asking for six months rent up front. Um, four week holding deposits and $200 a week rent increases. I've seen multiple of those. Um, so it feels, uh, yeah, very high risk at the moment. And so you just sort of put up with, with, um, with the energy and efficiencies and other issues that come with being a renter in Sydney. Um, I think it feels like landlords buy a rental property as though it's a zero risk investment. And certainly I've come in, I've seen circumstances where, you know, landlords and real estate agents are completely shocked when you're asking them to make a repair or if this property shows any signs of, um, of inhabitants. Um, it often feels like they don't understand the obligation, their obligations as a landlord and they don't care about the people that live in the homes. Um, I hope the minimum standards will have uh, investors thinking about the responsibility that comes um, with being a landlord as their chosen form of investment. Um, and I think minimum standards will help families by removing the onus of self-advocacy. I often think if someone with my skills and experience finds the burden of self-advocacy too much, I can only imagine um, the fear that others have in these circumstances. Um, I've, that's it from me. I just want to thank everybody for their interest in this project and thank the team for um, their hard work in pulling the blueprint together. And I'll stick around for questions if there's any that I can answer. Thank you. Thanks, Gemma. Um, and thank you for sharing. I know it's not always easy. And as you as you said, if if you know someone in your position that has a good education and and can do self-advocacy finds it challenging in this environment um it's you know sharing that i think is 
really helpful for other people in similar situations as well. So I really appreciate your time. Um, uh, and now we'll hear from um, Sasha as well to hear about her experience. Sasha's from WA. Hi everyone, I'm Shasha. Um, actually, I live in the inner west of Sydney, so also in New South Wales. Um, firstly, I just wanted to say a um, big thank you to Joel and Bernie and the Better Renting team um, for inviting me here to speak about my lived experience. And also um, just to give a bit of background um, as to what my current living experience uh, conditions are. Um, with regards to the research that I participated, um, I participated in both the winter 2022 and this past summer 2023 research. Um, the research has been really eye-opening. I had been in my current rental about a year before uh, participating and then being able to see the data had confirmed to me that this is one of the worst rentals out there. I've been renting about 30 years and this is my 10th rental so I've got a bit of experience um, around Sydney. Um, I live with a chronic illness and actually moving into this property has made that significantly worse to the point where I've actually got a proper diagnosis so it's that bad and it also has a huge impact on my mental health. Now being in a place without insulation means I actually can't cope with my physical conditions let alone um, mentally with everything um, but first how do I know that my place isn't insulated? So sometime during the winter 2022 research, my roof actually collapsed. Um, I think I've got a picture <laughs> slide with that coming up. Yeah, so what happened, I think it was just um, so much rain and relentless rain and humidity that caused the drywall to collapse. And I could see through the hole that there was absolutely no insulation, it's just drywall. Um, so living in this place I spend more time trying to feel okay to even be able to just eat because I have no appetite and doing chores is a struggle I don't remember the last time I got restful sleep here which impacts how much energy I have during the day and the most times I remember feeling at my baseline is mostly around about two hours a day at the most um, I'm also a full-time carer so um, living in rental properties and not actually supporting people with disabilities is another huge issue as well. So I spend more time here trying to regain my energy to just live here than actually living my life. Um, I just want to bring up the next slide, which is some screenshots I took of the data. Okay, so there's a, a few sections. So on the far left side, that's the most recent data set um, for this summer that's passing. Um, you can see that my the temperature in my rental is just, it fluctuates wildly. At one point, it, the difference was like 27.7 degrees during with one day, which is ridiculous. Um, I've zoomed in to that day, so in the middle, uh, middle section, um, you can see that it was really hot and really, really humid as well. Um, so yeah, we have to run the air conditioning. I think we ran it for a whole week without being able to turn it off because it was just ridiculous day in and day out. And we <laughs> couldn't be gladder to actually leave the home to go somewhere else. Um, we also have single glazed windows that face west, which gets the hottest afternoon sun. I've had to purchase thermal blinds to block this at my own cost, but it also blocks sunlight, it blocks uh, fresh air. Um, and we live off a main street, so it gets pretty dusty and very noisy here as well. The other interesting thing is um, the food that I buy goes off a lot quicker. I think my fridge isn't coping with the, the conditions either. Um, yeah, we don't have fresh food in this house. You pretty much have to eat it the day that you buy it, otherwise it just goes off. So, you know, it's like a vicious cycle. I have to go shopping more, but I can't do that because I don't have enough energy because I haven't been resting well. And I've got my care duties that I have to do. So then I end up having to buy delivery or takeout, but that's very expensive as well. So the cycle is just, it goes on and on and it's not healthy and it's not sustainable as well. Um, and just very quickly, the last slide on the far right is about winter. Now the house is really cold in winter and with my condition, I can cope with cold a bit more, but it was also really humid the past winter as well. 
which meant we had to invest in a dehumidifier at our own cost. Um, there was a lot of mold happening, so we pretty much had to action that immediately. Um, the way that I would describe living in this house during winter was like, um, you know how when you been in the water for a bit and then you leave this, the, the pool or the, or the sea and your body feels a bit heavy? That's literally how I felt living in winter here every single day. Um, and not to mention my energy bills are just through the roof and I've had to dip into my savings just to pay, cover some of those costs. Okay, so really um, the Sydney rental market is absolutely insane right now. And the options that I really have, which I don't really think are options, is to stay here and suffer <laughs> or move into a new place and potentially suffering because I have no idea what I'm going to get. And I have to pay more rent for something that probably hasn't been fixed. And I won't know how ethical the real estate agent or the landlord will be and whether I'll get any kind of support living there. And of course, I will be so afraid to ask for any kind of repairs because I'll probably just get evicted because no grounds. Um, and moving, it's uh, ex uh, it's expensive, it's um, torturous, it's exhausting. So we don't want to do that too often. Yeah, so I think on a daily basis, I can speak for a lot of people here in that we are constantly faced with day in and day out anxiety and stress of constantly not knowing what our day is going to look like tomorrow, next week, next month. You know, housing is a basic human right, yet it's been driven as a profit machine for a number of decades now. A healthy home is the basis from which we make all of our other life decisions. And without it, we're not safe and we can't function in society. Um, I think the, the minimum efficiency standards being introduced is really, really urgent. And immediately, um, we really need to stop the no grounds evictions. Um, cap unrestricted rental price increases, make it a legal equal, sorry, make it a legal requirement for owners to ensure their properties meet these minimal um, energy efficiency standards like they are um, enacting in the ACT. And the question I think is how do we shift the mindset away from housing equals profit machine to housing is a basic human rights? And you know, the government's talking about building more housing. Imagine doing that and not having proper insulation, for example. That would just be like uh, putting a bandaid on a bullet wound, I think. Um, I'm really glad that this research is creating such conversations like this. And um, yeah, I really think change needs to happen now. Um, I'm really uh, happy to be part of this research. And I wanted to thank everyone for coming along to this talk. And um, yeah, that's my up, the time up. And um, hope you all stick around for the Q&As. Thank you. Thanks, Shesha. Um, and apologies, I saw the Western and ignored the Sydney part. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you for sharing your story and for participating in, in the better renting research. It's really important to have those lived experience um, examples and stories told. I'm, I'm, as chair, going to change the agenda slightly. We were going to hear from Joel next about how to use the blueprint, but we're going to go straight to the panel Q&A and then we'll finish up with Joel um, um, talking about how people can use the blueprint. So um, we're a little bit short on time. So we've got literally five minutes for the Q&A. So can I please invite back Joel, Rob, uh, Leo, Gemma, Sasha, um, to the group. If you've got any questions, um, please put it in the chat. There was a question which, Rob, I, I know that you answered, but it, I, I, it would be good probably just to, so everybody who's not monitoring the Q&A can hear. One of the questions was, why are we talking about minimum energy standards? Um, and yeah, so it would be good if, um, I don't know, Rob, if you might want to respond to that. Yeah, it was a really good question. Thanks for um, that. Uh, I think that came from Kit. I'll probably answer it in two parts. So the first bit is what do you mean by, what, what does minimum mean? And it's got different meanings in different contexts. We're not saying you should do the least possible to homes. What we're saying is if we are going to come in with legislation and tell people what to do, uh, working in environmental and social policy, it's very hard to get legislation over the line to do the right thing if you work in justice or military oh my god you get all the money um so 
what we're trying to say is what would be the you know the the absolute bare minimum that every single house should have and we want that level to be as high as possible um and working out what that level is is a is a question the second part i'd ask is well what is why should we be kind of going for um that rather than going every home should be 10 stars i can tell you from my own home i'm getting my home from like one to two stars I and mean, it was 2.2 stars to sort to about four stars or something like that it's quite easy i'm getting it to six stars a bit more expensive and getting it to seven stars that i got it to was was more expensive but very doable getting it to 10 stars we are talking like hundred thousand dollars you'd have to pretty much knock it down and rebuild it um and most of the health and bill savings come in that jump from about two to about six stars from about six to 10, it's much, much smaller bickies in terms of your energy savings. So if you're building a new home, go as high as you want. And probably the most cost-effective level is about eight that most people find. Um, beyond that, it's a lovely vanity project, but you know, do it, it's great. Um, so if we're talking about how to deliver the most benefit to the most people, aiming for that sweet spot in somewhere between four and six is probably about right is my gut feel for that, but we still have more work and data to work that out. Um, I don't know if anyone else has got a view on that. Did anyone else want to respond to that question? Okay, thanks. Thanks, Rob. That was that's really helpful to hear. And certainly what we've said in the blueprint is that if mm -hmm. if landlords, whether it's social, public housing, community housing, or private renters want to go further faster, then they should absolutely do that. And in fact, what we hear from community housing providers is it makes much more sense for them to do a bigger retrofit um, at, at one time because it's more efficient. Um, so, you know, that's that's certainly good to hear. Just given that we have limited times for um, four questions in in the blueprint, you know, we we've talked about a whole range of things which at the moment are not on the agenda of the national framework. So, you know, we want to see model performance, we'd want to see the use of assessors, um, we want to see um, renter protections in there, we want to see a really good uh, verification and compliance regime. Um, and, and, and for the scheme to be ambitious, you know, we, we don't have decades to wait um, to improve the standards of homes from an emissions perspective, but also from a, a health perspective, um, you know, energy savings perspective. Um, I just I just wanted to hear from each of the panel, why do you think it's important that the blueprint in its current form is implemented? And what do you think are the consequences are if we end it up with a weak scheme? Um, so, Joel, I might go to you first. Thank you. Uh, what a question. So why is it important that it's done like this and what are the consequences if it isn't done like this? Mm. Yeah. I think there's there's two sorts of ways of thinking about social change and, and it's, it's really clear what it's going to be like. Sometimes you can look at a step forward and think, even if this isn't the best outcome, it's something we can build upon. Um, or I think there's sometimes it actually happens that by doing an inadequate version of the thing, uh, we actually deny ourselves the opportunity to a better version of the thing. And I think that's really relevant to how I think about this. Probably what I'd say is that where it's a matter of degree, I think any progress in this area will be a good thing. So, for example, the ACT is requiring rental properties to go, if they're below R2, to go to R5. Now, we might argue that they should be requiring all properties below R3 ceiling insulation to act and maybe to go to R6. Or you might say in Victoria, the ceiling insulation, so where they have an energy efficient heater requirement, that maybe that should be based upon two stars energy efficiency. Sorry, it's based upon two. We might argue it should be higher. But you're sort of toggling the settings there. Where I think you can get it wrong uh, is where, those set, where actually some more binary things are wrong. So, for example, we're really keen to see a mandatory standards see the right sort of enforcement systems in place from the get-go. If that's not done, uh, and if, for example, governments went for just a disclosure-based thing that is sort of quixotically relying on the market to do something here, then that's a lot of wasted time. And it could potentially mean that the 
um, issue sort of gets put to the side for a few years while we then learn that that hasn't worked. So I guess the benefit of doing it this way is that it does put a good foundation in place that is something we can ramp up over time. And to that question about minimum standards, I think we see this as something that begins picking the low-hanging fruits, going up the industry, and then we can toggle those dials up, hopefully all the way to 11 if we're lucky. Um, but if we get the, the sort of fundamental design questions wrong, then that is potentially actually a step in the wrong direction rather than just a smaller step in the right direction. Thanks, Joel. Um, Gemma or Shasha, do you have any thoughts on that, you know, from a lived experience perspective? Only that I think that, you know, a lot of people of, well, my generation, if I can say that, but I think a lot of people generally are sort of seeing being a, a renting as something that you're going to do for a long time now maybe your whole life um, I think probably in it, you know previously it was seen as something that was a, a temporary thing something that young people do before they can you know buy, buy their first home but most you know I would say a, a lot of my you know friends family colleagues are almost resigned to the fact that they're going to be renting for um, most if not all of their lives and so I think there's sort of there needs to be that that shift in attitude that um, you know renting is something that everybody's going to be doing um, for a long time and that we need to um, I think you know um, be uh, regulating accordingly. Yeah thanks thanks Gemma. Um, Sasha or Leo? I just wanted to quickly support Gemma and say 100% what she said. Um, and also with regards to renting as well, um, we're kind of stuck in this situation because we can't get loans as well. So that's a completely different conversation, but trying to get a loan based on our incomes on disability incomes or pension incomes are nearly impossible. So it's a, tra it's a trap, like we're, we're completely trapped in this cycle. And if we don't, get this uh, policy right and you know there's iterations that will happen um, but if let's just say the policy gets hap haphazardly introduced and you know like it wasn't done properly then I would fear that there would be some retaliation from potential um, this industry like landlords to say hey you guys are trying to to do this but me as a landlord I'm protecting my own interests so I'm going to increase the rent even more or do some other things to ensure that we're stuck in this cycle so I think that's sort of like a fear that I have if this is not done properly. Yeah thanks thanks Sasha um, really important point. Um, Leo? I think it's really part of that that new conversation about renting this is uh we know that these kind of standards ha aren't going to come along by themselves so having the blueprint out there as a uh as a guide to what's both achievable it's realistic it is you know aspirational uh from maybe where we stand now but it is not you know, dreaming. And it's like Rob was saying, like, in relation to the stars, it's not that everyone's saying, okay, we have to go to 10 stars. We're, it, it is a very achievable, realistic goal. Just going back to Gemma and Shasha, like, the, the underpinnings of that, we have uh, a lot of the reason that owner-occupied housing is so much so expensive is that the next best alternative of renting has been kept intentionally such a poor experience. And that actually puts this premium on buying an owner-occupied owner home. Uh, it drives people to borrow huge amounts of money. It makes the problem worse. Uh, so if we can get renting homes that are actually safe, stable, affordable, healthy places to be, it actually is better for the renters living there. It's also better for people who do want to buy a property because they won't have to uh, pay this, this enormous premium. Uh, a, a lot of people talk about wanting to own a home. And what they really mean is, a space that they can feel some ownership of, that they can feel safe in, uh, they can feel like it is genuinely their home. Um, and that is a big part of what this whole project is about. Uh, and it is economically the most sensible thing to do, environmentally the most sensible thing to do, morally the most sensible thing to do. You know, it's, it's we are just stuck in this very archaic uh, approach to housing, which really 
uh, limits the options that you have as a renter. Yeah, here, here. Leo, well said. Um, I've been a terrible chair and we've, we're running over time. Um, and I know Gemma has to go, so I just really wanted to thank her for her time. Um, for those that can stay, we're, we're five more minutes, I swear. Um, Joel's just going to quickly talk about how you can engage in this. Um, and then I'll just finish up with a few thank yous. Um, so if you can hang on for five more minutes, that's great. If not, thank you very much for uh, joining us today and listening. Um, and you can find all this information on Healthy Homes for Renters. Um, Joel, if you can quickly run us through the... <laughs> How do you right, use... I'll do it in three minutes, Kelly. Thanks, Joel. Yeah, so I guess probably... Here's some of the ways that you can think about using the community sector blueprint based on how we've been using it and how others have been using it so far. So it's a really useful way if you sort of already all over this issue to be briefing other people um, about this issue. So we use it to brief new supporter organisations at Healthy Homes for Renters. It can also be really useful if you're a community sector organisation engaging with governments, uh, with public servants to sort of help um, explore some of the issues and put get them out there as well. You may even be a public servant who finds it useful to brief your, your minister. I don't know. I'd like to think it could be helpful for all of us in that way. It might also be useful for sort of internal briefing within organisations. So I think within Healthy Homes for Renters, developing this has been so useful. Uh, and I think for new organisations who come on board, again, it's something they can circulate internally to, to get a team across this. Uh, and it's also useful for think up policy development and for making submissions or engaging with policy processes. We, for example, use it for a submission to the National Energy Performance Strategy. That said, it's a big document uh, and you might look at it and feel a bit intimidated. So we've created the Community Sector Blueprint one pager, which is also available on the website on the same page, which is linked there. This one pager is a bit like a wingman for the Community Sector Blueprint. It sort of helps to broker an introduction and make them a bit more accessible. It's not a summary of the blueprint as such as a bit of an overview uh, that says, here's what it's about, here's what it's for, here's what it can do for you. And so maybe that's a good place to start uh, if you are feeling a bit intimidated by the blueprint itself, uh, which is, you know, riveting reading, but maybe not, not for everyone. What it also does is it can put you in touch with, with me and with Bernie, the, the team working behind this. Uh, and we encourage you to get in touch if you've got any questions, but in particular, if you'd like to endorse the organisation, um, we've already had a lot of endorsing organisations shown here, but we'd love to get another page worth of endorsements uh, coming out of this webinar and in the coming months. Probably we will be engaging with the official national framework when it comes out and having lots of endorsements before then will be really powerful. So I do encourage you to, to take a look at the one pager, take a look at the blueprint and get in touch about endorsing it if you haven't done that already. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Joel. And Bernie has just shared the um, email address in the chat for info at healthyhomes.org.au. Um, so I just want to, I'll, I'll quickly wrap up now and just want to thank um, all our panel, panellists, um, uh, Shane Rattenbury, who has left, but it was great to have him there. Thanks to Leo, Rob, Joel, Shasha and Gemma for your time today um, and really encourage people to um, engage with healthy homes for renters it's you know it's a really important issue and you know change is afoot so really excited to be part of that change and the more people we have behind us the more effective the changes that we can create so thank you for everyone who has been involved in the development of the blueprint um, and for those that will continue to be involved going forward to create that change um, hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day and has a fantastic weekend uh, we've recorded this and we'll be socializing um, this, it'll also probably end up on the Healthy Home for Renters page as well for people who want to share it around. Okay, lovely. Thanks, everybody, and um, be well.